Hi, everybody. I'm Tracy Cook with Redmond Magazine, and I'd like to welcome you all to today's webcast, Attacking and Defending Active Directory Workshop, sponsored by Comparis. Comparis is the leader in identity-driven cyber resilience for cross-cloud and hybrid environments. Semperis provides threat mitigation and disaster recovery solutions for enterprise identity management systems, the keys to the kingdom. Its patented technology for Microsoft Active Directory protects over 40 million identities from cyber attacks, data breaches, and operational errors. It is a Microsoft partner, and its technology is recognized by Gartner as the only fully automa automated AD recovery solution available in the market today. So for more information about Comparis AD, Threat Protection and Recovery, visit their website, www.comparis.com. And now I'd like to start off with a few housekeeping details. We are hosting a Q&A session after the presentation, and we encourage everyone to participate. So get your questions ready, and we'll answer as many as we can. So Paris has provided a number of resources, and you can find them in the, in the resource tab. So please check them out and download or link to that link to the link to the webcast. Link to, my goodness. Download them and link over to their website. This webcast is being recorded and will be available for replay. And you'll receive an email when the replay is available. So now I'd like to introduce our speakers. We have Darren Marlia, VP of Products at Some Paris, and Andy Robin. Adversary Resilience Lead at Spectre Spot. So thank you both for joining us and for the audience. You're in for a very interesting webcast today. Um, and so we'll begin. Andy, please take it away. Thanks, Tracy. Um, thanks for that introduction. Again, my name is Andy Robbins. I'm the Adversary Resilience Lead at Spectre Ops. I'm a co-creator of a tool called Bloodhound, which is used to find attack paths in Active Directory, and I'll be showcasing that during the webinar. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at that handle. It's uh, underscore Waldo with a zero. And I'll put uh, pass it to you, Darren. Thanks, Andy. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, Darren Maralia, uh, as Tracy said, VP of Products at Semperis. Uh, done a bunch of different things over the years. Um, when I'm not on the computer, I'm usually on my bike, hence the picture. Uh, my Twitter handle is there at Grip Policy Guy, and i um, happy to uh, have everyone here during these uh, times. I know it's a, kind of a, a strange world in which we live right now, uh, so hopefully this uh, provides some interesting diversion to what's going on out there, and I hope everyone is staying healthy. Um, let me just quickly talk a little bit about who Semperis is. Semperis is a, uh, as Tracy mentioned, we're focused on two main areas today, disaster recovery for Active Directory and uh, sort of uh, this tra tracking and detection of either uh, legitimate or non-so legitimate activities within Active Directory. So we have our AD Force recovery solution and our AD um, uh, uh, directory services protector solution. So both of those solutions provide kind of an end-to-end -end story for uh, active directory protection and then recovery in the event that something uh, terrible happens. And, uh, and with that, I want to just make it clear that this is not going to be a product-focused discussion. This is very much going to be a technical discussion. And so uh, I want to dive right into that by talking a little bit and kind of setting the stage about active directory. So uh, for those of you who have lived in Active Directory for a long time, you know that um, Active Directory has been around for a while. And it's really, I would say, only in the last maybe five to six years where we've really kind of heard a lot about uh, Active Directory being a target for attackers. And not that it wasn't before that, but I think what's happened is that the attackers and the tools that attackers have available are becoming more sophisticated and taking full advantage of what's out there in Active Directory. Certainly, 
Uh, you know, when I first started working with Active Directory in the late 90s, just before it shipped, um, the, the notion of a perimeter inside an enterprise network was a pretty solid one. And nowadays, I would say that it's it's pretty well dead, that there really is no perimeter and, and getting access to and getting into a network is a lot easier than it used to be. And uh, because Active Directory has been around for a while and it comes from this pedigree of being behind four walls and 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 so you didn't the threats that you thought about were were not typically the threats that you were protecting against in Active Directory. And I would argue that its design is such that it doesn't expect threats from the outside. Um, that, that it's become a soft target for a lot of attackers. And and the last point that I just want to make is, you know, I think nothing here we're, we're going to talk about could be considered a vulnerability in Active Directory, in as much as it's some sort of exploit of poorly written code within the operating system, but rather vulnerabilities in the way AD is deployed in customer environments. And I think that's an important thing to remember. There certainly have been legitimate vulnerabilities in Windows and in AD. There's no denying that. But I think with respect to AD, the good news is that uh, we, we actually, from a defensive perspective, we actually have the ability to make changes to protect ourselves in, uh, in today's world. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Andy, who's going to talk about uh, attacking AD. Yeah, so uh, I, want to, I want to repeat one of the points that Darren just made. So I come from a pen test and red team background. And um, back in like 2005, 2006, like all the way up to like 2009, um, you could, as a pen tester, pretty reliably just uh, use server-side exploits to compromise a window system, and then from there just use common local admin passwords to move around to any other system in the network or in the domain. Um, those days are not necessarily over, but there are much more reliable and much more safe methods available to pen testers and red teamers now that, like Darren said, don't rely on exploits of any kind. Um, so there's there's no chance of blue screening a system or crashing a system in some other way. Um, now, like most of the attacks are abusing built-in administrative protocols in the Windows operating system and in Active Directory itself. So we're going to go through a whole attack path um, over the course of this webinar. I'll be doing the I'll be doing the attacking. And so the first thing that I want to show you is kind of the step zero of that attack path. And so that's going to be analysis and planning. And so what I'll do is collect some data with Sharphound, which is the data collector for Bloodhound. We'll import that data into a, a special database called Neo4j, which is a graph database. And then we'll use the Bloodhound GUI to identify an attack path that we can use to get to our objective. So let me share my screen and uh, I'll play this first video. Uh, I also do have a, I, I have this entire lab set up and running now in case there are any questions that I can answer with showing you something in the, in the lab itself. So what we're looking at here, this is Win10001. And we're running as this user called Jeff Dimmick, Jeff Dimmick. And we have the Sharphound binary in this directory. And so we're just going to do the default, no options, uh, standard data collection with Sharphound. And in my very small domain, obviously, that ran very quickly. Um, and so you can see exactly what it's, what it's doing. Um, and the, the final part of that that's more relevant to, you know, kind of the, what level we're talking at right now is this uh, output that you get, this uh, 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 date timestamp underscore bloodhound.zip. This file, uh, Sharphound will generate with all the information that it was able to collect from the domain controllers and from the Windows endpoints, zip it all up, put it into that file. That file, uh, by default, will just be in the same location as where the Sharphound binary uh, was run. Uh, and then importing that into the Neo4j database is actually extremely simple. So um, on my Mac here, I'm taking the zip file, and just drag and drop it into the Bloodhound GUI, and that's it. The data collection process is totally done. So 
let's say that our objective, like we're say we're hired by a, a retailer perhaps, or um, maybe a, a credit card processor, and they want to know, is it possible to go from um, any user in Active Directory and compromise a host in the PCI enclave? Well, there are a lot of really interesting queries that are built into Bloodhound, but really like one of the more powerful things is you can do arbitrary pathfinding from any asset in Active Directory to any other asset in Active Directory. And that could be from a user to a user, from a workstation to uh, a group in AD. It doesn't matter. Uh, the, the database is totally agnostic. It doesn't care about that. So I can say, well, um, give me like a path, if there is one, from the Jeff Dimmick user to this PCI server. And when I hit the play button here, we'll we'll see what that path looks like. So Bloodhound runs that query against the Neo4j database, and we get a path. Um, let me briefly explain what this path is. We are going to go through and exploit each of these things over the course of this webinar. But essentially, you can just read this from beginning to end. So Jeff Dimmick is a member of the domain users group. The domain users group. Um, kind of hand wave here uh, belongs to the authenticated users group. This is kind of a hack we do. There's no real connection here, but effectively everybody belongs to this authenticated users group. This group, the authenticated users group, has admin rights on this computer here called Win2016001. This computer is allowed to do what's called constrained delegation against this system here, this desktop 4AM BQF0 system. On this system is a user logged on called GPO admin. This GPO admin user has full control of this GPO called protect PCI enclave. This GPO is linked to an OU called PCI enclave. This OU contains another OU called PCI computers. And finally, under this OU is a child computer called PCI Server 001. So we have our attack path. We know exactly how to go from this user, Jeff Dimmick, and compromise this server, PCI Server 001. And over the course of this webinar, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you exactly how each of those attack steps work. And then Darren will be giving you some defensive considerations on detection and prevention uh, side. So let me close this and we will go to the next step. Let me stop sharing my screen temporarily. So this, this is our attack path. This is a, a slightly different layout, but it's the exact same attack path. Um, so the first step here is going to be taking our access of this user, Jeff Dimmick, and turning that into privilege code execution on that first computer there called Win2016001. So if we kind of put into words exactly what it is we're doing, this is, this is our first attack step, is going to be lateral movement. So the authenticated user's principle has been added to the local admins group on a computer called Win2016001. We're going to use Cobalt Strike, which is a commercial red team tool, and it has a built-in lateral movement module called PSExec. We're going to use that to move to Win2016001. And that module works the exact same way that the legitimate sysinternals PSExec works. It creates, starts, stops, and then deletes the service on the target machine. And that service runs as the system user. Obviously, you must be an admin on a system to be able to do that. So. Let me share my screen again, and we will run through that process. So as you can see, we've, we wrapped up our SharpHound data collection, we imported that. And then let's say that this Win10001 system where Jeff Dimmick was logged on, let's say that we're able to convince him to click on a, a, a payload, we're able to fish him, or somehow otherwise we're able to get initial access on the system. In this instance, I'm just going to use this uh, beacon payload, which is just a, uh, a binary file. I'm going to double click that and then come over to Cobalt Strike. And now at the very top here, I, I have a new beacon session on this computer, Win10001, 
running as the Jeff Dimmick user. I can interact with that beacon. Um, and one of the first things I'll do is I'll just list out the running processes. Uh, as I'm waiting for the job to finish, uh, we can go back and look in the uh, Bloodhound GUI. One of the nice things that we that we do in the Bloodhound GUI is if there's ever any question about how how can attacker actually abuse this, what does this actually mean? Um, you can right click on any of these connections and then click Help, and you'll have this new modal pop up that gives you general info, um, particular uh, abuse info that's specific to that attack primitive. Offset considerations, so how the attacker could get caught, and then references that um, provide further reading uh, specific to this uh, particular TTP. So back in Cobalt Strike, we're on our initial system. We've run, we've listed out the running processes. We can see that. We can see the output of who am I? So I'm the Jeff Dimmick user, and. So first, we'll we'll see if that win twenty sixteen zero zero one host is alive. So we'll ping that. We can see we get uh, four ICMP responses back. And in Windows, by default, if you're going to try to list out the remote uh, hidden C dollar share, you must be an admin to do this by default. So if we if we ls that share from this system win ten zero zero one running as Jeff Dimmick, when we see this output, that's an easy test to verify that we are actually running as an admin against that system. We have admin rights against that system. So um, very simply, we'll use the PS exec module in Cobalt Strike. Uh, the options here, we're specifying the remote system. We're saying what share we want the payload to be written to, and then what our listener name is in Cobalt Strike. And then as soon as we run that, we have a new interactive session uh, or non-interactive session running on the system called Win2016001. And as you can see, we're actually running as the system users. We're running as uh, the equivalent of root in the, in the Windows world. Uh, we can run the running processes. We can run who am I. We see that we are running as NT authority system. So that finishes the first uh, step in that attack path. And so I will stop sharing my screen and then I will uh, pass it back over to Darren. Great, thanks, Andy. Okay, so uh, Andy has just taken advantage of, uh, well, actually, before I say that, first of all, I just, I, I, want, uh, I want everyone to sort of think about what, what just happened there, and especially around what Bloodhound was able to do. Um, if you haven't, if, as, a, as a blue teamer, if you haven't installed and used Bloodhound in your environment, uh, I highly recommend you doing it. Uh, it it's, it really kind of underscores what I was saying earlier that that Active Directory as a piece of infrastructure was was not was not built with Bloodhound in mind. Um, and what I mean by that is that the ability to read pretty much every object in Active Directory is the default scenario. And you know, when I first started playing around with defending Active Directory, one of the ideas that I had was, well, could we could we harden that read access? Uh, could we remove read access for certain objects that would be interesting for attackers? And the answer is in a lot of shops with the complexity of applications and uh, infrastructure that they have, it's really hard to do that. Uh, so, so you have to take a, a combination of tactics to defend against this. Um, I'm going to talk in each of the attacks that Andy shows, I'm going to talk about detection, which I have on the screen now, and then prevention. And in, a, in I would say in at least a, a fair number of these cases, prevention is your best defense. What is it? The uh, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I think that's really true here uh, in, this in, in, in this kind of a scenario. Um, if you can prevent a particular attack path, it's going to be a lot more reliable than trying to detect it. Uh, I am not going to talk about necessarily any third-party products. Um, for sure, you can get EDR products and other security products that can do various levels of detection. What I'll say about that is if you're expecting that a particular third-party security product is going to solve all of your problems, it's you're probably going to be disappointed. I'm sure that's not a surprise to anyone. What I like to do is take a combination of tactics. If you have uh, you know, third-party EDR solutions, do your own additional monitoring, and that's what I'm going to kind of talk about 
um, within the, my slides. So the, the first slide talks about detection of this lateral movement. And so there's a couple things I want to touch on. One is that when Andy uh, executed the PS exec cobalt strike uh, attack into that remote system, he uh, essentially mimicked what, what PS exec does, which is to attach to the remote system, have the service control manager create a new service, and then spawn whatever executable you want to spawn out of that is. Um, in addition, just to get to that point, he ran Sharpound against Active Directory. And Sharpound does a set of uh, well-known LDAP queries against AD looking for uh, you know, this, this path that it's looking for. So I'll talk a little bit about how we can, we can look at that as well. Um, you know, I will mention Azure ATP has this, uh, I think, fairly recently introduced ability to look for LDAP queries that are known to be signatures of Sharpound running um, to do detection, but you can do this as well, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that with ETW. So right now I'm just going to share my screen, and I'm going to show you a couple different things. So the first is um, Sysmon. So Sysmon is, uh, let me wait for the screen to come up. Looks like it's painting on my side. So Sysmon is a sysinternals utility that Microsoft provides for free. Uh, it's, it's pretty well known uh, uh, security utility that you can run as a persistent service on your Windows systems. And you can feed Sysmon a configuration and that configuration contains the kinds of things that you're interested in looking at. So um, Sysmon is, is using, under the covers, it's using low level uh, event tracing to do things like looking at process creation, looking at network connections, looking at DNS queries, a whole slew of things that Sysmon can do. Uh, you can customize the configuration to reduce the noise on it, and I, I highly recommend you doing that. What I ended up doing for my example is I just took uh, an out-of-the-box Sysmon config that good old Swift on security wrote and put out on GitHub, and this does kind of a, a, a tune set of things that it's looking for. And so when, uh, for example, Andy executed his Cobalt Strike PS exec, sure enough, Sysmon fired off, and I just simulated this in my own environment, but I have Sysmon sending events to the security, or to the uh, Sysmon event logs here in Event Viewer. And you'll notice here this event, the service control manager created a new service using the PS exec service executable, and then PS exec fired up, you see the, the PS exec service as the host process fired up command.exe. So with using Sysmon and your ability to sort of parse and collect an alert on security event or uh, Sysmon event logs, you can look for this kind of activity. Now obviously this is a tuning exercise. You have to know what you're looking for in advance um, and, and try to, you know, sort of uh, uh, anticipate what you're going to see here. And, and obviously, attackers will attempt to obfuscate what they're doing. So you, you sort of have to deal with that. It's like, an, it's like I was saying, it's not a perfect solution. And you definitely want to take a defense in depth approach to this. So use this in conjunction with other solutions that you might have. Um, but then the other side of this is the initial discovery. And I talked about Andy using Sharpound to do the initial discovery. So what I want to do is just quickly show you on my domain controller, I have the ability, and this is, this is the Perfmon utility running, there's built-in event tracing that you can do in Perfmon, and there's a built-in predefined data collector called Active Directory Diagnostics that contains these ETW providers. You can certainly roll your own uh, with just custom providers and additional providers. ETW has a rich set of providers related to pretty much all aspects of AD, Kerberos, et cetera. Um, but I just did a collection uh, while I was running Sharpound on my system, and I was able to see, if I dig into this and look at searches, I was able to see searches, search queries that Sharpound had executed, um, and in fact, it shows the system that I ran Sharpound from, the process ID, and then the query that it executed. So I'm able to get some sense of what is happening against my Active Directory from an AD query perspective. Now there are tools and utilities you can use to consume this information in real time. 
So if you're running event tracing on your domain controllers, you can collect this data and alert based on, let's say, a filter name. And, and I mean, I realize this is very role your own, but this is a, a, a great way of being able to see at an LDAP query level the kinds of things that are hitting Active Directory. So with that, I am going to stop sharing and hand it over back over to Andy for the next. Uh, actually, before I do that, let me just talk about defense. Apologies for that. I, I'm uh, sorry. Let me just back up. Um, okay. Hopefully, you can see my defense screen. Uh, apologies for navigating my way around the UI. So, what what can we do to defend against this? Well, Andy took advantage of the fact that authenticated users was in the local admin group on uh, the machine that he was after. And that pretty much should never happen. Uh, if you have your regular users and local administrators, you might as well just walk away because game over in that case. Um, but what I always suggest is that people tightly manage local group accounts and membership, whether it's you're using group policy or Intune or scripts, uh, it doesn't really matter, but having really tight control over who is in the local administrators group. It really should be very few, if any, users. And practice credential social distancing. What I mean by that is um, this following little graphic in here talks to the fact that admin tiering, if you haven't heard of this, check out the Microsoft Pass the Hash white paper. It's been around for a while. Admin tiering is this concept that you have separate accounts for managing domain controllers, workstations, and servers, and never the twain shall meet. So essentially, if I'm a workstation admin, I cannot, under any circumstances, log into servers. And if I'm a server admin, I can't, under any circumstances, log into workstations. And I sure as heck can't log into domain controllers if I'm one of those previous two. Now, I know that admin tiering takes a change in the way you do business, and so it takes work to get it implemented. But there isn't, there aren't very many, uh, so let's say, free solutions for, pretend, for preventing credentials from being littered all over your environment than taking some approach like admin tiering. So I highly recommend folks look into that. If you haven't already, um, revisit it, because I think it's a, a, let's say, free and easy way to solve some of these problems where credentials are left all over and end up uh, essentially being abused by attackers. And with that, I will pass it over to Andy for the next attack. Cool. So the, the next step in our attack path is uh, constrained Kerberos delegation. And I'll bring up the graphic again so that you can see what it looked like visually. But to explain it in words first, the desktop 4AM, et cetera, machine trusts Win2016-001 to delegate credentials for other accounts. So what that means is that by abusing the S4U to self, S4U to proxy process, we can impersonate other users when we access Win2016-001 um, or I'm sorry, the other way around. We can impersonate other users against desktop when we're, when we're accessing them from Win2016-001. And so even if anybody who I'm currently running as or the system itself, even if my system doesn't have admin rights on the desktop machine, I can impersonate a, another user that does. And by doing that, I can gain admin rights and pivot opportunity against the the system that's next in the attack path, which is actually desktop 4AM, et cetera, not this Win2016 system like the slide says. My, my bet on that. So let me share my screen, and we will see what this looks like uh, from the attacker perspective. So Win2016-001 is allowed to delegate credentials to desktop 4AM BQF. Again, we can click the help uh, button in the Bloodhound GUI to see all kinds of different helpful information, including example uh, attack uh, commands that you as an attacker can run or as a defender you can look for in your logging. Now, I mentioned that you know this, this system, Win2016-001, if we try to just 
authenticate as a system user against this other computer, desktop 4AM, we're not gonna be running as an admin because this computer doesn't have admin rights on this other computer. But we can impersonate another user that does have admin rights on this system. So I don't have the information in the database, but as an attacker, I can make a pretty good guess that the domain admins group probably has been added to the local admins group on this system, as that's the default uh, configuration. So in Bloodhound, I'm going to find the domain admins group. I'll click on it, and then I'm going to see uh, who belongs to this group. So I've got I've got three different uh, users here to choose from. I've got the David McGuire user. I've got this SQL01 account, and then I have the default Red 500 account, just called administrator. So I'll click on David McGuire and see what information Bloodhound has about this user. Now, uh, one very very important thing with uh, Kerberos delegation is that if a user is marked as sensitive and cannot be delegated, then you cannot delegate their credentials to other systems. So this user where the property cannot be delegated, um, from the attacker perspective, I'm looking for this to say false uh, because that means that I can delegate credentials as David McGuire under certain, certain circumstances. For example, when I have a constrained delegation uh, opportunity in front of me. So I'm going to impersonate David McGuire, and I, I'm going to impersonate it specifically against the desktop machine, specifically from the Win 2016-001 machine, as we see in our original attack path here. So this computer uniquely can impersonate other users uniquely against this system. It's not as if I can just impersonate David from the system and just be a domain admin everywhere else. It's only to this one system here. But that's all we need in order to uh, continue our attack path. The tooling I'm going to use uh, for this step is called Rubyist, uh, which is uh, made by a, a coworker of mine uh, named Will Schroeder, uh, whose handle is uh, Harmjoy. So first things first, in my, in my Cobalt Strike Beacon, I'm just going to start with a clean slate. I'm going to purge any Kerberos tickets that I have loaded. And then um, when, you, when you're running as the system user and you authenticate to other systems on the network, you're doing that as the computer account in Active Directory. So whatever privileges that computer account has, you as the system user, which I'm running as, also have those privileges. Our computer is not an admin on desktop 4AM, so I get access denied when I try to list out the contents of the C-share remotely. Um, and then this is the command for Rubyus that I'm going to use to create a, uh, a SIFS service ticket for David McGuire that will be trusted by desktop 4AM. I'm not going to go in depth on what all these different command line switches mean, but um, there is a link uh, to Will Schroeder's post, so you can you can see more information about this if you're interested in exactly what all these different switches uh, are actually doing. So uh, I'll create uh, a ticket for myself uh, against that system uh, for the SIFS service, and so now I can list out the seed dollar contents. Um, from this system. And the reason for that is because this ticket that I generated with Rubius, um, the system is actually going to use that to authenticate against that system. So I'm not, I'm no longer authenticating as the system user or as the computer account. I'm actually authenticating as David McGuire. I'm actually authenticating as the domain admin. Even though he never logged onto this system, he never um, authenticated against my system, we can just create a ticket for that user out of thin air. And then we can authenticate to this particular uh, uh, desktop machine over here. So uh, having a SIFS ticket is nice because we get SMB access. But if we want to laterally move with uh, PS exec, for example, then we also need to have a ticket for the host service as well. Um, and that'll give us access to the uh, service control manager on the remote system. And the service control manager, of course, is what we use to um, uh, create remote service, create services remotely on that system. So again, I'll just very simply use the PS exec module in Beacon. Um, and because I'm authenticating as David McGuire, um, I have the, I have the ability to create services on that remote system. Uh, 
So once that's done, we now have a new beacon running as the system user on desktop 4AM BQF0. And again, I can list out the running processes on that system and I can see um, uh, what other processes there are, uh, who the owner of that process is, et cetera. And interestingly for the next part of our attack path um, or the, the last part of our attack path rather is this GPO admin user is interactively logged onto this system. So um, in, the next, uh, in the next step, we'll look at how to continue on with our attack path. So I will stop sharing my screen and Darren, I will uh, pass it back to you. Great, thanks Andy. Um, okay, so uh, let me push the next slide and we can talk about detection of Kerberos-based attacks. Um, so, so I think of all the attacks that Andy's gonna show, I think Kerberos-based attacks are the hardest to detect. And, and the reason for that is as Andy implied, a lot of what you're doing with these Kerberos-based attacks is just mimicking normal behavior in, in terms of Kerberos usage. In his case, he just created a ticket uh, essentially out of whole cloth uh, because he had access to that machine account and was able to impersonate any user or a, a particular user uh, to be able to gain access to another system. Um, the, the the, the normal way of detecting that would be to turn on Kerberos-based event logging and try to find patterns uh, of, of uh, let's say, unusual Kerberos activity. For example, Andy used the RC4 hash of the machine account in that example with Rubius to be able to generate the ticket that he needed. And RC4 uh, is not necessarily the default that's being used by most normal Windows operations. So if you can find a Kerberos event uh, for a ticket granting service request uh, that has RC4 on it, this could be a, a sign of a, uh, let's say, a, a, an attack path that's, that's or somebody, somebody attacking Kerberos. Um, now, the, the problem with this is that a lot of the tools now uh, are able to generate or use uh, more modern hashes um, like AES that are that are harder to that they're they're going to be the default that are being used normally. So it will be hard to differentiate these requests from um, from from normal requests. And there's already going to be a ton of events that are being thrown to your domain controllers. But keep in mind, you also need to put this on every resource. You have to have Kerberos logging enabled on every resource that could possibly be attacked because in some cases, the KDC, meaning the domain controllers, are bypassed completely by, uh, by these Kerberos requests that are being fashioned by attackers. So you sort of have to be everywhere collecting all this data and looking for these patterns. And it's just, it's, it's, it's a hard problem to solve. Uh, certainly if you're rolling your own, it's a really hard problem to solve. Um, so from a defense perspective, that tends to be where we find the best uh, chance of success against these attacks. So just a few rules here that I've listed. You shouldn't be using unconstrained delegation in any case for a particular service running on a particular machine or user. So unconstrained delegation is just a, a recipe for abuse. And what unconstrained delegation is, is if you go into the delegation tab on a particular machine, you, you'll see that you can control which users have access to which SPNs or which services on that machine, and you can control that fairly tightly. Now, Andy still took advantage of constrained delegation to be able to do his attack, so it's not a catch-all, but it certainly limits uh, at least the, the, the worst possible scenarios. Um, limiting write access to machines and users that have SPNs. So what I mean by that is there's attacks you can do in Kerberos that once you have right access to the attributes on a machine account or user account for that matter, you can uh, perform uh, sort of abuse against those using Kerberos. Um, privileged users with SPNs should be highly protected. Service accounts with SPNs that have, should have complex periodically rotated passwords. If you're familiar with the concept of Kerberosing, this is a situation where the, attack, uh, the, the attacker looks for uh, service accounts that have SPNs that may have old passwords, passwords not rotating, and then essentially brute force those 
and get access to that and then act as that account on other services that that account has access to. And then as, as Andy briefly mentioned when he was showing the Bloodhound UI, marking privileged users that you don't want to be delegated as sensitive and cannot be delegated. And you do that in Active Directory users and computers as this screenshot shows. Um, you obviously have to test that because there may be accounts that need to have that capability. But the point is um, you don't want an account that's privileged to be delegated if it doesn't need to be. And, and the goal again here is to, is to make it hard for the attacker to get access to credential material for an account or an application that's trusted for delegation. In, all, in almost all cases, these Kerberos-based attacks are using the, the credentials, the uh, RC4 hash or whatever the hash happens to be of the machine account or user account to generate the tickets they need to move around the network. Um, and with that, I will hand it back to Andy. Thanks, Darren. So the next step in our attack path is going to be involving the, uh, the Windows token model and how we can abuse that model. So the GPO admin user is interactive, interactively logged on to desktop 4AM BQF0. And processes that are running as this user or, or processes that this user is running have primary tokens, which means that they are tokens that the user can use to authenticate to other systems in the network without having to retype in their password over and over and over and over. So as an attacker, if we can inject ourselves into one of those processes, then we can just use one of those tokens and impersonate or authenticate as that user to other systems in the network, including domain controllers. So let's look at what that looks like. I will share my screen. And this is gonna be probably a very quick one. So here we are back in the Bloodhound interface. And the next step was this desktop 4AM computer has a session for GPO admin. So that means this GPO admin is logged onto that computer. Uh, again, right click the edge, click on help, and you've got all kinds of different uh, helpful information um, for the red team side or for the blue team side if you want to know more about that attack primitive. Back in Cobalt Strike, we can see that uh, this is where we left off. So we did a process list. We're currently running as the system user. And remember that the system user, when it authenticates a, to other accounts, it does so with the computer account in AD, the, the privileges that the computer account has um, on other systems or uh, in Active Directory itself. So we need to be running as the GPO admin user instead. There's a thousand different ways to do this. Um, one way we could dump out the clear text password perhaps for GPO admin, or we could pull out the NT hash for that user. But as more and more controls go towards protecting those, uh, those uh, passwords or protecting those hashes, the tried and true method of abusing the Windows token model is still there. So we're gonna find this uh, process here. We're gonna, we're gonna choose explorer.exe and we're going to inject into this process. So we're going to have a new beacon running in this process. This couldn't be simpler in Cobalt Strike. We just say uh, inject, then the process ID for the process that we want to inject into, uh, the uh, architecture of the process, whether it's 32 or 64-bit, uh, and the name of our listener in Cobalt Strike. When we run that, we get a new beacon in, and we can see that we're now running as the GPO admin user on the same computer, desktop 4AM BQF0. Uh, and then now when we uh, do uh, shell who am I, for example, when we type this command, we're gonna see that sure enough, we are running as GPO admin and we have all the rights and privileges that, that come with being that user. All right, that one's pretty short and sweet. I will pass it back over to you, Darren. Great, thanks, Andy. Uh, let's see, let me get to the next slide here. So, uh, detecting credential abuse. Uh, I'm sorry, de 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 detecting credential theft and token abuse. Um, this one, again, is a little bit tough from the detection side, um, being able to detect, uh, at, least, at least in a kind of a homegrown way. Um, 
Andy actually pointed out a great uh, PowerShell script that was written by one of his colleagues uh, that uh, I have a link to here that uh, will look for processes that have been injected into. Um, Sysmon can also do this. Uh, there's an article I'll, uh, I'll see about trying to make the link available, but there's an article I found on using Sysmon to, to detect uh, process injection. It's a little tricky because in, with Sysmon anyway, you need to have, you need to put specific memory addresses in there, which is not necessarily something you're going to know ahead of time for every type of process injection. Uh, but you can do this. Um, it's, it's just obviously you have to be doing this in real time on every endpoint, which makes it even more difficult. Um, defense is probably the best way to control it. And uh, again, you know, keeping privileged users off of endpoints, especially outside of their tiers. Um, I go back to my discussion about tiering. If you have server credentials, server admin credentials lying around on desktops, in other words, they've logged into those desktops and are still stored in LSAS memory, then anyone that's on that desktop machine that has administrative or debug access to that machine can get those credentials using tools like Mimikatz and use them to get off of that tier into the, the tier that those credentials have access to. So the, the ability to, um, you know, to control where those credentials are left lying around in LSAS is a key part of preventing this kind of attack. Um, in the case of Andy's example with that GPO admin, if that GPO admin is, lo is logging into a workstation, they better be a tier two admin only. So if that GPO admin can manage GPOs linked to servers and domain controllers, then they're violating the, the tiering model and uh, and potentially causing this kind of attack to, to be, frankly, much easier than it otherwise would be. Um, and then I'm going to pass it back to Andy for the final attack. All right. So the final part of our attack path is going to be probably a subject that's pretty near and dear to Darren's heart. Uh, uh, we're going to abuse group policy. Um, so the GPO admin user... Uh, as you would guess from the name of the of the account, has control of lots of GPOs, including uh, a GPO that affects our target system, which is PCI Server 001. Now, it's no exaggeration to say that you can do practically anything with GPO. If you can imagine it, you can do it with group policy. And that includes lots of extremely powerful defensive things and also extremely powerful offensive things. And so by abusing this privilege, being control of a GPO that applies to our target system, we're going to execute arbitrary commands on that target system, even if we have no direct network connectivity to that system. So let me share my screen one final time, and we will see how this attack works. Right, back in Bloodhound. Here's the GPO admin user, it, and here's our target system, PCI server. GPO admin has generic all or full control of that GPO called Protect PCI Enclave. That GPO is linked to an OU called PCI Enclave, which has a child OU called PCI Computers, which has a child computer object, PCI server, AKA the system that we want to take control of. Now, a lot of times when you think about lateral movement, you think about, well, you're making a direct connection to that system on 445 or 3389, so SMB or, 30, or RDP or what have you. But what group policy uniquely allows us to do as an attacker is compromise systems that we have no direct connection to in the network. And a PCI enclave is something that uh, uh, you would commonly associate with that. Uh, PCI enclaves are supposed to be blocked off from the rest of the network. You're not supposed to have your uh, your, your card uh, holder data uh, just willy-nilly all over the network. You're supposed to have it in one discrete part of the network that is closed off from the rest. If those systems are joined to Active Directory, and if those systems are getting group policy, which they are, or you can configure them to as an attacker, then you can achieve code execution on those systems 
You could do all kinds of things. You could degrade the security posture of the system by turning the Windows firewall off or by giving authenticated users local admin rights or, or what have you. In this example, we're going to use uh, a, a tool called Sharp GPO Abuse uh, from our friends over at F-Secure. And uh, I'm not going to go into exactly what all these command line switches mean, but effectively what we're doing is we're creating a new scheduled task that is going to run on any computer that this GPO applies to. And what that scheduled task is going to do is run this PowerShell command here that is going to download um, our beacon stager and then give us a, a beacon in uh, Cobalt Strike running on that system, uh, our, our target PCI server system. So I'll copy all that, paste it in here, and I'm running this command, uh, mind you, as the GPO admin. So this is actually going to go to the DC. It's going to fiddle with group policy. It's going to create that scheduled task. Um, and then once the uh, background group policy update process runs on our target system, which is the PCI server. The PCI server, which is here, will grab that uh, scheduled task uh, and then execute whatever the command was. It's just going to do what it's designed to do, what, what group policy is designed to enable. So we don't want to wait for that. Uh, we're just going to go ahead and uh, run GP update uh, on the system. So we'll do a GP update slash force. And then we will come back over to Cobalt Strike as, uh, as our group policy client is going through and analyzing uh, which group policies apply to me, what do I need to pick up from each of those. That can take a little bit of time. Uh, but eventually, uh, we'll see that we get a hit in our web log in Cobalt Strike to our stager. Um, and then eventually, we will have a beacon running um, on that system. I'll fast forward a little bit just to make the time go by a little quicker. And here we are. So on PCI server 001, we have a new beacon running as the system user. Uh, we can interact with this just like we can with any of, the, any of the other beacons. We can list out running processes. We could install maybe a, you know, a credit card uh, you know, skimming uh, uh, piece of malware or, or what have you. We could explore databases that are on the system that might have cardholder data, wh whatever you like. Um, once you're the system user, you have total control of the computer. So I will stop sharing my screen. And Darren, I'll um, pass. Great. Thanks, Andy. OK, so detection around group policy abuse. Um, a lot of the approaches and tools that are that Andy just showed uh, for example, the Sharp GPO abuse, uh, the PowerView uh, new GPO immediate task. What they are doing is injecting changes directly into the sysvol part of the GPO. Uh, a normal, let's say, GP editor, you know, administrator making a change to a GPO with GP editor, they are using uh, basically changing both the AD side as well as the sysvol side of a GPO. If you're not familiar with that. Uh, I've done a bunch of writing about the various parts of GPO on my blog, but the point here is that when you've got one of these attacks, what typically happens is the file system is hit with this new setting, but the, the, the corresponding AD change does not occur. So you can look for this pattern if you do file system auditing on your DCs uh, of the sysvol folder. This is where policy keeps its settings. And you can see those patterns and then alert on them. It obviously takes some logic to see the event happen and then look for corresponding version number changes on the GPO side. Uh, but essentially, that's your best bet for finding these uh, uh, kinds of things as they're happening. Now, from a defense perspective, there's a lot more here you can do. Um, you know, you can, first of all, keep really tight control over your del GPO delegation. So who can edit your GPOs? It should match your tiering model. So for example, only tier zero admin accounts should be able to edit and link to containers that control access to domain controllers. I will make the statement here, which doesn't require a lot of explanation, but I'll make the statement that if I can edit a GPO or link an arbitrary GPO to some container that contains domain controllers, whether it be the domain controllers OU, uh, the, the domain level, or a, an AD site that contains uh, DCs, then I essentially have control over the domain. 
And I've written about this on my blog, but essentially it's as easy as that. So you, you really want your the people that manage your group policy objects that have right permissions on your group policy objects should be appropriate to their tier. If you have GPOs that are linked to OUs that contain workstations, then only tiers, tier, uh, sorry, tier two admins should be able to edit and link to those OUs and edit GPOs. So keep tight control over GPO linking. Again, any containers that affect domain controllers should be tightly controlled so that a very small subset of admins can link, uh, and, and that's the, the, the right permission on the GP link attribute on those OUs and domains and sites. And then from a security posture perspective, group policy is often used because just like AD, group policy objects have grant read access to everyone. Group policy is often used to uh, provide insight into what the security posture of an organization looks like. So reducing read access on GPOs that deliver security settings, like hardening settings, is a really good idea. And if you, uh, I have a link here to a script that I wrote called Get Vulnerable GPO that looks for those GPOs and suggests hardening for them. Uh, I've written it also extensively about this. Um, I know we're running out of time, so I want to make sure we get some time for questions. So I think that covers it from a GPO perspective. Um, from an additional resources perspective, there's uh, a, a few links here. You can view some demos and, and attacks that we've done on our website, some dis discussions about AD disaster recovery, getting in touch with us if you're uh, looking to defend Active Directory or looking to uh, protect Active Directory. Uh, there's a link here. Finally, questions. Um, Tracy, maybe you can ha help us with uh, some of the uh, questions that are out there. Sure, I'm happy to do that. And thank you, that was a great presentation. And I also wanted to let the audience know that we apologize. Some of you had some technical difficulties. However, we are recording this webcast and we'll get you the link to the replay later today. So we, so look for that and you'll be able to, to get, the, get the whole presentation. So I have a, a, a question and it's for Andy. And it's, is marking domain controllers with unconstrained delegations by design, is that a concern? Right, so uh, it is the default configuration and whether that is by design, I, I, can, only, I can only provide my own conjecture about that um, without reading the, the technical spec or the functional spec for, for Active Directory, I would assume that it is by design. Um, the the other question is is that a concern i would say no and the reason i would say that is domain controllers they they all have the ntds uh, dot dit database so they all have the credential material for all principles in the domain the unconstrained delegation configuration on a on a system um, becomes a concern when the system is not a domain controller and when there are attack paths that lead to uh, the compromise of that system. And the way that unconstrained delegation works means that you must have code execution on that system, plus you must have a user perform a non-interactive logon to your system, and then you can, you can uh, have a forwardable TGT for that user that you can then authenticate as a user anywhere else in the domain. But if you have code execution on a domain controller, then I would say that having access to all the credential material for all those users precludes the need to abuse unconstrained delegation. So it is the default configuration. And I, without, without doing a lot of research and a lot of work, I would, I would currently never recommend somebody change that configuration on domain controllers in particular. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, here's another question. When you were speaking about admin tiering, what did you mean by credentials being left all over the environment? Yeah, um, so I think I alluded to this a little bit later on after this question was asked, but, but essentially, um, 
a lot of the ways that tools like Mimikatz or similar tools that harvest credentials off of the system work is they take advantage of the fact that the LSAS process on Windows will cache credentials for some period of time for users that have accessed those systems. And, uh, and, and so if I have access to a particular system where, let's say I'm on a workstation machine, and let's say somebody who is in the help desk admins group has logged into that workstation machine to help the end user that's on that machine. That help desk admins user, their credential material is now cached in LSAS. And as an attacker, I can get access to that and use that to act as that help desk admins user and move around the environment, move laterally to other systems. Um, and and so if, if, if I'm not in a tiered environment, that help desk admins user may have access to not only workstations, but also servers, the ability to edit GPOs, all kinds of, you know, depending on how the, uh, how the administrative model is set up in that shop, um, it, it's sort of like you, you've left parts of yourself all over the environment, and I can use those parts of you to, uh, to move anywhere that you have access to. That's, that was kind of what I was referring to. Okay, thank you so much. And here's another question for Andy, and it's, um, what is the downside of marking an account as sensitive and cannot be delegated? Right, that's a, that's a fantastic question. So um, marking an account as sensitive and cannot be delegated will make it so that whenever another principal tries to delegate credentials for that account, the domain controller uh, will not allow that to happen. Um, it will it will not it will not grant a, a, a ticket um, in that circumstance. So where this can become an issue is many applications legitimately use uh, constrained delegation or Kerberos delegation, um, you know, writ large, uh, I guess. Uh, so there are many examples of this uh, web applications. Um, you you may have a. a uh, an email web application that is delegating credentials for users after they authenticate to the um, email application, and then the email application may need to authenticate to other systems in the domain as that user. And in that kind of instance, it may use uh, Kerberos delegation. It may use constrained delegation to do that. So the downside of marking an account as sensitive and cannot be delegated is you may deny that user the ability to use applications uh, like that. Uh, there's some research that I that I want to dig into that will help um, kind of ease the process of marking accounts uh, as such without um, without uh, having as much of an impact on them uh, that you may otherwise. Um, and as soon as that research is, is is done and and kind of mature, then I'll then I'll put that out there. But um, great, great question. And you know, so the downside is that you can deny those users the ability to use any service that otherwise would delegate credentials for uh, for those accounts. Great, uh, thank you, Andy. We are running a little bit late, but we are going to answer a couple more questions. So please hold on. And here we go. What is Azure ATP? Uh, yeah, I think I, I referred to this in one of my slides. So uh, Azure Threat Protection, or uh, it, it, it's uh, <laughs> there's a, a product that Microsoft purchased uh, called ATA, uh, Advanced Threat Analytics. ATP is a sort of newer version of that. Um, still uses a lot of the capabilities of ATA um, and aggregates them up to the cloud for sort of doing analysis of lots of activity related to Active Directory authentication and use. So it's looking for patterns of use within Active Directory and, uh, and aggregating those and analyzing those and being able to alert on specific uh, types of attacks that we've talked about today. Uh, so it is a commercial product. Uh, I broke my rule of not mentioning commercial products, but it's Microsoft, so I figured, uh, okay, if people already know about it anyway. So uh, that, that's ATP. Okay, thank you. And Andy, um, what do you recommend for antivirus on DC? 
I've heard recommendations, but wanted uh, to get your thoughts. Yeah, fan fantastic question. Uh, there's lots of options, obviously, uh, lots of competition in that market. Um, I can give you my perspective from uh, the, the red team side, which admittedly is a little bit out of date. I haven't been doing red team um, for the past about year and a half. Um, but in my experience, and I believe in, in a lot of my colleagues' experience as well, um, one of the more effective uh, antivirus or endpoint security solutions, if you will, um, is actually Microsoft Defender. Um, coupling up Microsoft Defender with uh, the, the Defender suite, I, uh, if you will, um, can give you a really powerful uh, suite of tools that um, uh, they're all going to be Microsoft supported because they're all created by Microsoft. Um, uh, and I would I would say uh, you know from from just the effectiveness perspective, they're 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 getting pretty damn effective um, at, at detecting a lot of these attacks. So um, I would say Defender is a really good um, option. Um, it's it's going to depend a lot on um, what capabilities you also have internally as far as staff and expertise, um, because just like any tool, the, the tool is only going to be as good as, as whose hands uh, the tool is in. So um, if you've got if you've got staff that you can that you can have uh, manage uh, the the endpoint security, that's great. Um, if not, there are other options that that are also really good. Um, uh, that does get into kind of more, you know, the territory about recommending particular services. So if, if you want to know more about that, I'd be happy to answer that offline. Um, so yeah, yeah, good question. Okay, here we go. We have another one. Uh, one way to disable Kubus delegation on privileged accounts is to add them to the protected users group, which um, adds many other protections and they want to know your recommendations. Darren, do you yeah. want to answer that? Yeah, sure. So uh, I think that's a that's a great question. So uh, for those of you that are familiar with it, there's a, a built-in group in AD called the Protected Users Group. Uh, when you put an account in the Protected Users, uh, there, as, as the, the, uh, the uh, questioner notes, there are other protections that are provided. Uh, one of those is, and, and I don't have the list right on the top of my head, but one of those is that essentially no NTLM authentication happens uh, with that account. So it essentially disables NTLM, which has obviously uh, benefits in terms of leaving easily cracked NT hashes lying around. Um, it, there are some implications on, uh, for example, uh, using RDP and uh, num blanking on the rest of them, but there's a whole set of things that change when a user, an administrative user, is in protected users, um, including uh, disabling Kerberos delegation. Um, the, in terms of recommendations, I think it, it's, a, it's a great thing to use if you can use it in your environment. I think some of those protections that get turned on will often break certain applications that administrators have to use. For example, non-Kerberized applications may not work if NTLM isn't available as a fallback. So I think you have to test, but I do recommend uh, in, in other talks that I've given, I do recommend putting admin accounts in protected users, or at least uh, some of the most sensitive admin accounts in protected users, if you can get away with that. Okay, great. <clears throat> I think that's about all the time we have uh, for today. and. We really appreciate Adam and Darren for joining us today and sharing all your expertise. It was a really great presentation, like I said before, and a really good um, Q&A session, too. So, so thank you. Thanks a million for being here today. And thank Thanks, you to Tracy. the audience. Oh, we're glad you were here. And thank you to the audience for attending today's webcast, sponsored by Stem Paris and presented by Retina Magazine. And I'd just like to repeat, again, the replay will be available later today. You will get an email when it is available, so look for that, that email from webinar notification. And with that, I would like to thank the audience, and I would like everybody to enjoy the rest of their day. And this concludes our webcast.
thanks again, all of you, for joining us. Thank you.